But the question we're really thinking about in this session is what will keep you going as a leader? What will enable you to persevere? Um, what will enable you to um, cope with and face the challenges that you experience as a leader? So really we're thinking about perseverance, keeping going, making it to the end of uh, the race as uh, leaders. I'm sure if you're anything like me, you will have seen colleagues, friends, are other people in ministry who, in one way or another, have given up. Some may have fallen in ministry. Others may simply have decided it's not worth it, and they've given up um, on ministry um, and leadership. So what we're really thinking about is how can we avoid that ourselves? What we're trying to do um, in this network is just really think about what, what it means to be human, what the Bible teaches us about being human, being created in the image of God, and how that cashes out in our leadership, and how that theological perspective helps us um, in leadership. Um, I'm not going to redo the uh, kind of you know, what the image of God means, but one of the key things we've seen about the image of God is that actually we were created for something better than we experience. That's actually the problem of being humans. We were created for something better. We were created for a better world. We were um, created um, to be eternal and immortal, and yet we die. And that's the dilemma of being human, is that God has put eternity in our hearts. We know that we're created for something better. We know that we're created for something eternal, and yet we live in this world. I was reading yesterday, there's an article in um, our paper back home, um, the oldest woman in Ireland is now 109. <laughs> 109. Um, she was being interviewed at this. She just said this. I loved this line. I just love living. But isn't that a great line? I just love living. And there's a sense in which as human beings, that's absolutely right, because that's what we were created for. But the problem is we live in a world where we know that um, actually that's not a possibility um, in the end. Um, and I think um, really what I'm wanting to say in this session is um, uh, as human beings, um, we, we, we find ourselves in that situation, but it's actually having an eternal perspective that enables us to live and serve well in the present. That actually, I think, key for leadership, key for the Christian life, is to have a right and proper eternal perspective. That, uh, that often, many of our kind of challenges and struggles are out of perspective because we've forgotten that eternal uh, kind of view. This is, um, I mean, you're, this is, I'm, I'm not telling you anything you don't know in this session, just hopefully reminding you of some bits and how they um, fit together. This is a, a kind of, you're probably familiar with this, it's just a potted kind of diagrammatic picture of biblical salvation history that helps us know where we are. So um, we were created to be in the presence of God, in his good world, everything was perfect. Uh, man was um, eternal. It's a very short period of time. Very quickly, that gives way to the fall and rebellion against God. We find ourselves cast out of the garden under the rule of sin, death, curse. That's the world that we live in, what the Bible calls this present evil age. Um, God is at work to redeem us. Jesus breaks into the world. And because of what Jesus does through his death, resurrection, ascension, gift of the Spirit... God's new creation has broken into the present. So in effect, we live in the moment in an overlap between the old fallen creation in which we live and the coming of the new age in Christ, the new creation. It's broken in in that if we trust Christ, we are new creations. We've already begun eternal life because we've been remade in him, but we still have to live out our life in this sort of fallen age with a fallen flesh. Ultimately, Jesus will return, the present even age will be brought to an end, and we will be living in the new creation and its consummation. That's the kind of framework, but I think that's crucial to understanding our life and experience. Because essentially, that is where we live, in between those two. We are both in the present evil age, and we are in the new creation at one and the same time. Which makes our experience, to some extent, slightly schizophrenic as Christians, because we, we have both of those experiences. 
And it's crucial to understand who we are and our life experience. And actually, I think that's crucial for us as leaders to grasp that as well. If I were to describe it, to summarize it in two ways, our experience of being in this kind of um, uh, current fallen evil age, the experience might best be summarized biblically as frustration. We find ourselves frustrated. Uh, and that is actually partly because we also know we belong to the new age to come. Our frustration is made worse by the fact that we know there is something better. But frustration is our current experience. Nothing is as good as it could be. Everything is ruined. Nothing ever kind of quite lasts. Everything is harder than we expect it to be. That's the frustration of being the current evil age. Our experience of being in the new creation is hope. And I think actually we are living with a mix of frustration and hope is basically um, how the Christian life, how leadership pushes out. I, I would imagine that's how you feel about your leadership. Elements in which there's deep frustration, but elements in which there's hope. And at one level, we're navigating the reality of those two things. And it's the hope that is the answer to the frustration. I think that's the really big thing that I'm thinking about in this session. Uh, one of my all-time favorite films, and this will kind of make me both old, and I watched it when I was about 17, so that'll kind of, is Back to the Future. I love Back to the Future, fantastic film. I think that actually could be, the title could be a description of the Christian life. Christian life is basically living with the desire to go back to the future. It's kind of where we came from, but it will be fulfilled in the end. And basically, we're living to get back there. We live with a future orientation, but we've kind of got to get there. There's a sense in which we've got there already in Christ, but we've, we've now got to kind of get back to, to where we're headed. That, that's really, I think, um, where we are um, as uh, leaders. And really, all I want to do is kind of flesh out what that experience might mean for our leadership. And I think understanding it and having an eternal perspective is crucial to persevering and keeping going in uh, kind of leadership. Okay, let me try and draw some things from this that might be helpful for us. Um, firstly, I think this impacts on our devotional life as leaders and, and how our devotional life ought to be focused and what it's for. Um, I, I think, and I come across pastors all the time, I deal with a lot of pastors, one of the things that most worries me is the lack of personal devotional life of leaders. I'm dealing with a lot of people who are doing a lot of ministry, a lot of preaching, and sadly, a lot of them will say, I never read the Bible for myself. I'm only ever doing it to do ministry for my sermon, for my ministry or whatever. I, I've ceased to be somebody with a personal devotional life, the Bible has just become my toolkit for ministry, my, my skills resourcing. I think that's a massive danger for most leaders. And in many cases, when leadership goes wrong, it's primarily because the devotional life of the leader has gone wrong. Um, I, I think that ought to be a warning to all of us, that that needs to be kind of prioritized. Um, my, my point here, though, is I think our devotional life is basically about orientating ourselves for eternity and around eternity and our hope. Um, I think the danger is that we can become those who read the Bible, and, and we read the Bible either to kind of master it and, and understand it, or we read the Bible looking for it to teach us a skills tool set. That makes sense? So we, are, we either read the Bible to enable to become an expert in the Bible, or we read the Bible um, a, 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 as a kind of a life coach manual of skills for ministry. And I think as leaders, we fall into doing that very easily in the way, the way that we read. Um, I think the absolutely crucial thing is we need to, we, the reason we need to listen to the Bible and God's word is it orientates us for eternity in the light of Christ. It reminds us who we are, where we're headed, um, and that becomes our kind of focus. If I can take you to Colossians chapter um, 3, verse uh, 1 to 4, 
I know this is to the whole church, but I think it's particularly relevant to um, uh, kind of leaders. It seems to me that um, uh, Ephesians 3, uh, sorry, Colossians 3, um, uh, kind of what, 1 to 4 is absolutely crucial for our orientation. And what um, Paul writes there is, since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. That seems to be absolutely foundational. But we need to um, uh, sort of remember that we are raised with Christ, we're seated with Christ. Therefore, our whole orientation needs to be on um, our, our kind of relationship with Christ as the one who's ruling, reigning, his new creation. Uh, Interestingly, the way that we do that um, is, I think, built out in verses 15 and 16. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your heart. That, that is the outworking of setting your orientation on heaven because actually the word of Christ is the word about Jesus, the one who's triumphed, who's risen, who's ascended, who's exalted, who, who's kind of reigning. And that's what we sing of to encourage one another. I, I think that's the orientation that we need. Um, and in our devotional lives, um, I think that heavenly eternal perspective that Jesus is the one who's reigning, and that we are the ones who are reigning with him, is absolutely crucial as a foundation for how we, we live. Certainly, personally, in my own personal devotions daily, that is what I'm constantly wanting to remind myself of, and then praise God for it. And everything else, I think, flows from that. So my, my personal devotions are not about skilling up, they're not about mastering the Bible. They're not about, in a sense, even things I need for the ministry I've got to do for today. They're actually about remembering who Christ is and who I am in relation to him and being um, in that position um, with him. Uh, it's interesting. Um, when you read the New Testament letters, very little in the New Testament letters speaks about the earthly life of Jesus. Almost all of it is focusing on the heavenly reign of Jesus. Um, my country, you might have noticed, um, our, our king had his coronation a couple of weeks ago. He spent 73 years waiting to become king, has now become king. And uh, in a sense, um, before he became king, everybody talked about his earthly life, how he grew up, what he did, his marriage, how it fell apart, all that sort of stuff. That was where all the focus is. I think having been crowned as king, that fades into the background to something new, which is the reign. I think it's the same for us as Christians. Our focus needs to be the reign of Christ, the one who's crowned and ruling. And um, our personal devotional life is bringing ourselves into orientation with that. So I, I would just say, orientate your devotional life around kind of eternity and Jesus, the reigning and ruling king. And that will actually help you to live in the present. We need that orientation. Because actually, I think it's being in that zone is the thing we forget. That's where we really are. That's where we're really headed. Um, and in a sense, we need to, uh, in a sense, bring that down into the present. Um, of uh, kind of where we are. So I, I would say as leaders, to keep going, to be properly orientated, a devotional life that reminds you of that, causes you to rejoice in it, um, is just really, really important. That kind of devotional life is to set our focus on eternity, I think. And that is absolutely foundational for us as leaders. If we're not, hearts are not set there, that will lead us to being unbalanced. Um, in our life and ministry. Um, secondly, I think an eternal focus, it is important in terms of thinking about um, our priorities in the light of eternity. 
Um, and here this touches on what we've been saying here. I think we, we need to avoid creating a false antithesis between kind of um, our lives now and our service of God. That, that seems to me to be a crucially important thing. That we have to remember we do actually live in both the new creation and the present creation. That has implications for what, what we do and how we kind of live our lives. In other words, we have responsibilities in this present creation that we have to fulfill. And they are not set against our service of God and the new creation. I think for most leaders, that cuts in on the tension over ministry and family, for example, or ministry and relationship. We, we can see those things as an obstacle to kind of properly serving, and then they tend to get sacrificed. But I think a proper perspective helps us to remember that we have to fulfill all our responsibilities and not set them against each other. It, it does mean that we do make choices about how entangled we get in um, this world. 1, 1 Corinthians 7, I think, is here is really helpful. Um, it's really dealing with the issue of kind of marriage, relationships, whether you should marry, whether you should be single. The whole perspective of 1 Corinthians chapter 7 is that we're living in a world that's passing away which is important, but not ultimate. And so um, kind of 1 Corinthians 7 helps us to think about our choices and where we give our energies in a kind of an eternal perspective. So 1 Corinthians 7 is very realistic. If you choose to get married and have a family, you won't be able to serve the Lord as fully as if you remain single because you've got earthly responsibilities. Now, Paul is not saying there that that's necessarily wrong. He's not anti-marriage. He does personally see some advantages of singleness, which for himself he values. But there is a real realism there of saying, in effect, you can't have everything. And you you have to, um, in a sense, uh, be aware of all of your responsibilities and fulfill them. So if you're married, then obviously you've got to work on your marriage, your relationship with each other, your love for each other. If you've got children, you've got to care for your children and and bring them up. We mustn't think that is kind of somehow the opposite of serving God. Actually, it's part of the way that we serve God if we have those responsibilities. Uh, And 1 Corinthians 7 is in the light of eternity. I think it cuts both ways. It says, be careful what obligations you take on in this world. Uh, Go into them open-eyed about what it will involve. Because you're not limitless. At the same time, where you have those obligations, fulfill them. Because they're part of your service of God and an outworking of that. Uh, And I think that helps us to navigate the tension between what feel like ordinary life responsibilities and living and serving for God. We mustn't set those two things against each other, else otherwise we'll live with an unbearable tension, or most often our families will significantly suffer. (laughs) Because we'll instinctively always choose what feels like the more God thing over what feels like the more mundane thing. 1 Corinthians is basically saying, don't do that. So um, in a sense, even our service in what look like mundane, earthly, this life things are done with a view to looking ahead to eternity. So uh, Ephesians talking about husbands and wives and how they are to love each other, that's all from the perspective of getting ready for eternity. The reason you care for your wife is because you're helping her to be ready for eternity. That's that's the kind of pattern that's being generated. It's all looking ahead to um, that uh, kind of ultimate goal. 
Um, and that's also, in, in a sense, also why church and meeting with God's people is important. That's an anticipation of eternity. So the reason why we make church a priority, why we want to keep meeting with one another, as Hebrews 10 puts it, is to build one another up and encourage one another and spur one another on for the ultimate goal of entering into the eternal rest. So um, uh, again, I think a problem for people in leadership, Christian ministry, particularly parachurch ministry, is church can very easily be neglected. Whereas actually it's essential to helping us to keep going. Um, because church is itself an anticipation of eternity. It's a mini moment in which we're anticipating where, where we're heading. So I think that, that perspective helps us to keep balance in all of these priorities. And not to sort of set them up as kind of conflicts. Now, um, there is always the danger, and I've, I've seen this in some of my pastors and leaders, there's always the danger of the person who so puts their family ahead of their ministry that they're basically lazy in their ministry. Um, but I would say 95% of leaders, it's the other way around. That the family is always sacrificed because of the apparently higher call of the ministry. Which is why there's so much fallout from pastors and leaders' children often, I think, in um, a, a kind of Christian ministry. Um, and I'm just saying we've just got to balance those things. Um, and we will get it wrong. And there is mercy and there's forgiveness. But we just need to think them through. And I think an eternal perspective kind of um, helps us. Um, in other words, God is big enough to take care of eternity. And if he's given us earthly responsibilities, it's right we fulfill them. Um, seems to me to be uh, an important perspective. Okay, um, that's balance. Um, let's think about our leadership identity. Our leadership um, our, our identity in the light of eternity. Um, uh, and here I think we just need to orientate and understand who we are um, uh, in the light of um, our eternal future and our relationship with Christ. Um, and um, I don't want this to come across the wrong way, but I think as leaders we need to realize that we're really not that important and our ministry is not that important. We're really not that important and our ministry is not that important. And we get that completely um, out of perspective. What really matters is, 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 that, is that kind of we know Christ and we're going to be with Christ forever. And that's the perspective from which we need to view our ministry. Our ministry is a temporary period of service that the Lord has given us. But it is not who we are and it's not the most important thing.